Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. My apologies that this video took so long, but given the length that you can probably see this running to, I think that there is a fairly good idea of why it was five, six, maybe seven days at this point since the actual reveal of the Collector's Edition and the last video I did on it. I wanted to take my time on this because it was a very important video, and we have this three months out from the final shape actually dropping. For this first video looking into the Entelaki law book though, I wanted to cover three different sections of it. These three segments are significant because they are our only records to have come from the precursors themselves. So if you want to go into the final shape, about as blind as possible, go ahead and skip over this video. But be aware that the lore that I'm discussing isn't actually something which should spoil any of the events that will unfold in the final shape. If anything else, it should enhance your understanding of them. That said, I'm not here to judge what you think is or isn't a spoiler. So. If that does meet your criteria, then be advised, we are going to discuss spoilers. Hopefully though, the rest of you are in for an interesting surprise. But first, a word from our sponsors at Starforge. If you're looking to get the best out of any new PC without the hassle of constructing it yourself, look no further, Starforge has you covered. Their PCs are made with a white glove service, and they have a two year parts and labor warranty. So if something goes wrong, don't worry, you are covered. You can get anything from one of their excellent starter PCs all the way up to their maxed out creator rigs. I got one sent to me a while back and it's still an absolute monster. Some of the top of the line parts and tech that you can get in this, all the bells and whistles. Also, check out the link in the description and use my code for a discount at checkout. Thanks again to Starforge for sponsoring this video and for being consistent friends of the channel. Anyway, back to the lore. So, before we start in earnest, I think a little context is in order. Actually, scratch that, a lot of context is in order. Seriously though, this bit is important. First of all, where in the world did this information come from? The answer to that is simple, the Fallen and the Vex. We're getting our information today from three different law sources within the Intelliki book. Two of them are from the Elixni and one from the Vex, by way of the Reef, who originally recovered this information through one of their better-known agents. It's good to know that the Coalition is sharing this intelligence to this extent as well. It bodes well for the future, and it means that if we are able to cross these secrets in these darker paths, who knows where our cooperation might lead us. Let's start with the Elixni side of things. After they had to flee their homeworld of Rhys, the Fallen found themselves pursuing the Traveler through the Void of Space. This would be known to many of them as the Long Drift. Now, there were a lot of catches that made their way to Sol, and they all arrived in a sort of piecemeal fashion as best we know. Lots of them ran into strange objects or phenomena along their way, and in particular, some of these ships would discover other vessels. Sometimes it was other catches, but in a few instances, some of them discovered pyramid ships. But not, notably, the vessels of the Black Fleet. These vessels were even more ancient than the ones that we've encountered. Yes, that means that they predate the creation of the Witness. And yes, that means they belonged to the Precursors. For the Vex side of things, the information was recovered from a Vex mind core. More specifically, the mind core of a Vex Minotaur from the Sol Divisive, recovered by Prince Aldrin Sov. I say Prince Aldrin Sov and not Crow because as best I know, Crow has never entered the Black Garden. Yes, he's flown tactical with us in that one mission where we went to discover what had happened between Riven and Taranis, and where we went to recover the Wish Keeper, but I think that that's not quite the same. In this instance, that I'm referring to in his former life as Prince Aldrin, we would see Prince Aldrin and Jolion Tildarakis jump into the Black Garden through the Vex Gate on Mars to discover some of its strange secrets. Assuming this is the mission I'm thinking of, he also brought back Asphodelia, a flower that blooms in the Black Garden and which now has been planted in the Dreaming City. It appears that this isn't the only gift that Aldrin brought back for Mara at the time. He also brought back vital intelligence. It's worth remembering that the Sol Divisive have a greater link to the Witness, and subservience to it is part of what they believe is the winning strategy. 
As we'll discover later, the Vex more generally might have a strange link to the Precursors as well. Ido also noted that these three records are a series of messages and conversations between two Precursor individuals. They have no names, but instead have identifier codes. This isn't to say that the Precursors are only identified by identifier codes, but it is to say that this is the way that we'll get to know them. The two individuals are known respectively as HNW047622 and RS624399. Ido has abbreviated these to HNW and RS to the benefit of everyone's sanity, but at some point soon, I'll go a step further. These two individuals are fascinating in themselves because over the course of their conversations, they sort of switch places as far as their positions are concerned. Now, what do I mean by their positions? Well, to explain that, let's add more context and talk about the factions involved in Precursor Society. Now, to be clear, these factions are obviously not the same as the ones we have on Earth, even though they took part in a governing institution called the Consensus as well, just like the one we have in The Last City. These factions are different because they are all organized based on their beliefs about the final shape and how they might best accomplish it. Whilst all the factions agreed that the final shape was clearly the greatest good imaginable, none of them agreed on how they might accomplish that greatest good. I touched on a bunch of this stuff in my initial video. I'm going to go over some of it again. My apologies if this is a little repetition. The first faction that we know of is called the Penitent, aka the Merciful or the Benefic. Reading into the book more, this faction basically saw the purpose of the Precursors as accomplishing the final shape through direct intervention, and an approach where they might guide others through the universe to the final shape as well. Something which some might call controlling, others might call compassionate, and it also generally led them to the stance of intervention to prevent great tragedy and disaster. In their minds, failing to do anything, and thus allowing cruelty to run rampant in the world, was kind of their fault if they simply allowed it to happen. So, they needed to intervene to make sure something cruel did not happen, because otherwise they were essentially creating the final shape's antithesis. The second faction of note was known as the Nihilists, also known as the Redolent and the Accepting. This faction believed that the final shape could not be accomplished by the Precursor people without their own destruction. From what we can glean, their positions stated to be this due to the past evils of the Precursor people. The Precursors were supposedly incapable of accomplishing this greatest possible good. Contrasted with the Penitent, this means that they would not intervene to assist people to prevent suffering, but merely saw that that suffering was a part of something imperfect that clearly was not part of the final shape. Not so much something where they stood by and didn't care because the final shape wasn't happening in that particular region at that time or whatever, it's more something to sit there and say, things will unfold as they need to, there's nothing we can explicitly do to render the final shape onto the universe. At least that's my interpretation of it. I hope I'm getting a lot of this right because this is a basis on which I think a lot of us are going to start talking about things to do with the witness in the future. Needless to say, this is a huge contrast to the position of the penitent. One of them is compassionate and will intervene on a regular basis to prevent tragedy. The other sees the intervention as almost pointless, and their position is called a dereliction of duty by the penitent, but to them they see it as natural that the final shape must be the greatest good and that because of their own flaws, there is no way that they can easily accomplish that greatest good. It's also worth noting that a point in favor of the Nihilists is that there was no point at which the entirety of Precursor society agreed on what the final shape was, and therefore sitting back and allowing the universe to unfold as was planned might well have been the correct call in their minds, and is much easier to justify with this. These two factions were clearly at odds with each other, but there were more factions that existed and were mentioned throughout the history of the Precursors as put down in the Collector's Edition. It doesn't mention too much about each of them individually. However, we do know that at the very end there was another faction called the Solipsists. 
Their philosophy isn't mentioned, but again, as I mentioned in my last video, I imagine it was more of a precursor-centric faction that would seek the final shape with indifference to the rest of the universe, just based on their name alone, but heck, we don't really know and what do I know, I'm just guessing. There are some other groups that are mentioned throughout the history of the Precursors as well, though it appears that they did not survive up until the point where the other factions that I've mentioned before had taken hold. In particular, there are two that I think are worth mentioning. For starters, there was the Swarm faction, also known as Profusion or Bountiful. Their philosophy isn't mentioned either, but the name seems to state what they were about and the law states that they endured a great, fatal error of some sort. Based on their name, you can start to think of a few things of what this might ended up being. It seems to imply that there was plenty within their life, and there was kind of an endless number of them. A seemingly endless number that then became too many, as the word profusion might imply. I get images of overpopulation, or expansion into a dangerous region, perhaps. But regardless, it's hard to confirm it when there are so few words regarding the Great Swarm's fatal error. There is just no way to know. There was also a group referred to as the Conquerors, aka the Primacy or Sovereign, who at one point in the history of the Precursors used the power of the Traveler to enact a terrible subjugation of some kind. The terms Conqueror and Primacy would seem to imply a single governing state, some kind of dictatorship that rose to power over all others, thus allowing a political mechanism for such subjugation. Probably this implies a history of violence and other terrible actions as well, given that they were using this power to subjugate their peers, a set of evils that the Precursors have no doubt recovered from, and yet these evils will have stained their history in a manner that some, I believe, will feel is irreparable. As for how these factions pertain to the conversation of HNW and RS, there is particular relevance when the Penitent and Nihilist factions come up. The Penitent position is one that is initially held by RS, but seemingly they abandon that position at a certain point, and choose to depart from the Precursor Society entirely, choosing exile as opposed to being a part of the Consensus. As for HNW, they argue against the penitent position at first, but eventually they join that perspective and merge with the other members of the consensus that remains to create the witness. That is a gross oversimplification of things, I'm sure, but the bulk of the information is what we'll be getting to in a moment. And it, suffice to say, there's a lot that these two characters, RS and HNW, go through. As for what these characters do in their lives, there is a reasonable amount of detail. The very first communication between these two is HNW sending RS a note about how their progress with transforming a solar system is going. They call themselves a gardener, although this is most certainly a reference to them being a terraformer or a seeder of worlds, and is not a reference that is trying to state that they are the Traveler merely that they are following in its footsteps and providing life where there was nothing. HNW even had a purpose-built pyramid vessel filled with all the requisite plant life and materials to kickstart ecosystems in their hold. RS, on the other hand, seems to have been much more involved with the political and societal stances of the penitent, at least initially. As far as their occupation is concerned, HNW refers to them as a doctor, which also seems to fit the reasons why they might initially have believed in the penitent position. Assuming that there was some kind of similar conception of the Hippocratic Oath in their precursor society, RS would have been in a position to help people and do no harm. Thus, their occupation was very much in line with their beliefs about the final shape. It is also noting that RS is seemingly spoken of by HNW with a little reverence. Apparently, they found some kind of great invention that allowed the final shape to be created more easily, at least from the penitent position. This seems to be to do with part of the life seeding equipment that HNW takes on their expedition. And finally, have you guys actually been keeping up with those names? 
Because I just about have, but man, I wrote this script and writing HNW and RS over and over again was driving me a little bit insane. Aside from the fact that it is easier than the full identifier code, I think it's also a lot less easy to understand that these two were people. And so, I think it's good that we give them nicknames, not just for the sake of making our own reading a little bit more digestible. I also want to do it so that we can actually acknowledge that these are not code, they are characters. Now, in the process of this, I do need to state I don't want to ascribe ideas or gender to these characters, especially when we have no clue what is and isn't relevant to each one, or to the precursors generally. I'm just doing this realistically because the names I'm about to suggest have the initials HNW and RS in them respectively, and I think that they are, I mean, they roll off the tongue. So, with that said, and with the idea that we're not trying to prescribe gender here, or anything else in between that might inadvertently colour our biases, and therefore leave us in a position where we're trying to assume more than is relevant, I am going to call HNW Hemingway and RS Rorschach. Doesn't need to be your names for them, but that's going to be mine, and that's how I'm going to refer to them in the rest of these videos. And yes, I know Hemingway is more M than N, but it rolls off the tongue, so sue me. Is that better? I sure hope so, because now we're going to examine the logs and the initial communication from Hemingway to Rorschach. This is our first log, and it is about the potential of the terraforming project that Hemingway is undertaking. I also have a moment at the end of each of these segments where I'll go through and read Ido's notes, which are also very important to understanding this. This first entry reads as follows. Type. Personal communications. Unsent draft. Retrieved from Wintership Simix Fell. Datapank E7819P. Origin. HD 219134, unidentified ship, tetrahedral structure, derelict, heavily damaged, left in place. Keywords, gardener, final shape, HNW 047622. Identities, HNW 047622. Annotated transcription follows. I arrived at the garden to be to find barren rock, as lifeless as the expanse around it. Just as the survey said, it's perfect. Rather, it will be perfect. The moment I laid eyes on the allotted system, I knew my initial plans had to go. How inelegant they were, those drafts drawn up in smiling ignorance. Only experience could have cured me of such short-sightedness. Yes, now I can see the path to the summit. Pyramidion. Final shape. Here, the Matreda blade leaves. There, the green glass Isbasi blossoms arcing overhead. I have brought enough progenitor material to seed a hundred worlds, never mind five. In time, there will be a grand harvest of panacea from this garden. I'm sure both you and your merciful, penitent, Benefic will be pleased. I could cover these barren rocks with greenhouses, of course. Rows of neat enclosures, lights in just the right spectra, growth solutions mixed to just the right proportions, microclimate domes calibrated within a fraction of a degree. Very neat, very efficient, very, very boring. After all, that would just be a reflection, shard, imitation of system R3TNPLRMA, wouldn't it? And you know I've never had any interest in recreating other people's designs. So, just between you and me, here's a little secret. The Panacea Progenitors weren't all I brought with me. <laughs> I can hear you scolding me now, but there was so much space in the cargo hold and, well, to be frank, you're not here to disapprove. Besides, if you could see this allotment as I do, see the potential writ in the cracks and crevices of every rock, feel the heart song of their molten cores, you would understand. But you won't need to take my word for it. By the time you can bear to leave work long enough to come visit, my garden will have taken root and grown strong. How lovely it will be 
to sit together and listen to the wind whistling through the boughs. Perhaps you will even smile. Oh, but I mustn't get ahead of myself. Before any of this can happen, I need to prepare. I've unfurled the pergola to capture what I need to weave each planet's atmosphere. The pergola's sail is so vast I must cross my ship from vertex to vertex to see around the sparkling cloth. It's exhilarating. I've wielded the gardener's tools before, but never at such scale. It feels unfair, honestly. You led the development of such marvels, and yet you're leaps away, unable to see the culmination of your hard work. I know you claim it doesn't matter to you, as long as you know your work is being put to good use, but still, permit me this idle fancy. At this rate, it shouldn't take me more than a few centuries before I have enough substrate to work with. And then... Well, you'll just have to come and see the... Summit. Pyramidian. Final shape. For yourself, won't you? HNW 047622. Transcription ends. Type. Ship Cargo Manifest. Retrieved from Wintership Simix Fell, Databank E7619P. Origin HD219134. Unidentified ship. Tetrahedral structure. Derelict. Heavily damaged. Left in place. Crystalline storage media. Keywords. Gardener. HNW047622. Annotated transcription follows. Preserved in resin. 5908 asphodelia, stem cuttings, panacea. 7734 verut, whole leaf cuttings, soil enrichment. 7869 isbati, root cuttings, panacea. 9405 spenel, bulbs, decorative. Additional entries omitted for brevity. Cold storage. 14,401 lyceridite, seeds, decorative. 17,092 andari, seeds, decorative. 18,734 matreda, seeds, soil enrichment. Additional entries omitted for brevity. Equipment. One, pergola for atmospheric weaving on loan. Four, replacement sails in case of damage. Three, creches for initial abiogenesis. Eight, abiogenetic solution, canisters. Six, cauldrons for elemental synthesis. 3,965 fundamental particles, vacuum tubes. Additional entries omitted for brevity. Transcription ends. Scribe notes. Note 1. This appears to be a general term used to refer to organic material with medicinal properties. This is noted by Panacea. Note 2. An organization of some sort, mentions of the group across various records suggest that its members were scientists and doctors. This is at the note of the penitent slash merciful slash benefic. Note 3. Another title for the great machine, the Traveller. This is noted by the word Gardner. Note 4. An identification code associated with this individual. Need to cross-reference. This is noted by the final entry at the code HNW047622. Scribe Observations I began my search with the familiar during the long drift, peaceful encounters between catchers were rare, even when they hailed from the same house. But when such meetings did occur, they would exchange valuable resources, including data. This practice helped the Elixni navigate that vast and dangerous void to know who might open fire or which areas had already been stripped of resources. These data exchanges leave traces and even if the relevant entries are later overwritten, a scribe can track these traces to their source, especially a scribe who grew up with the hum of a servitor. I 
combed the databanks of our light ships for any mention of the witness and followed those paths as they forked through dozens of catches, based on a single mention of records recovered from a, quote, tetrahedral ship, I was able to track down these transcripts. They were buried in the databanks of a decommissioned house winter catch, the Simix fell. Repairing the ship's generator was quite an adventure. I shall have to tell you about it another time. According to the Simix Fells collection log, the transcribed records were originally found aboard a derelict ship encountered during the long drift. Associated telemetry suggests that this derelict was similar, but not identical, to the Witness's fleet of pyramid ships. An older design, perhaps. The ship was ancient beyond reckoning, and though it was badly damaged and abandoned, some of the data crystals were intact enough to be decrypted. It's a shame that the Simix Fell did not bring along any of the physical crystals. I'm sure the Cryptarchy would have liked to have a look. These are the oldest of all records I have found, by an order of magnitude. When they were originally penned, the species that would go on to become the Acumene had not even emerged from primordial ooze. Though my findings are not conclusive, I believe that these documents were created by the Witnesses' precursors, which revered the Great Machine as the Gardener. See Report Number 776, Asa, Witness. Though they were hardly the only civilization to use a similar title, other elements suggest a possible connection. The tetrahedral structure of the derelict where this record was recovered, and the repeated mention of a concept roughly translated as the final shape. There was one last note of interest from the collection log, about the star system where the derelict was encountered. Every planet in the system showed large-scale damage from crude explosives. No signs of life were found. Okay, so that's a long, winding lot of stuff that we need to now unpack. What does it all mean? Well, let's start with something about Hemingway and Rorschach's relationship, which is that Hemingway was in some way a subordinate of Rorschach's. This is speculative, of course, and just to call someone subordinate in terms of position isn't necessarily to say that they were working for Rorschach. It is simply to say that they treat them with a fair degree of reverence. And that subordinate position could be born of any number of things. But it is the fact that they ask for forgiveness rather than permission that gives this all away. And then the fact that the message was actually unsent, meaning that they didn't end up wanting to tell on themselves. This could just be a pair of colleagues, one of whom is superior in rank. This possibility seems likely given that the Great Pergola being hoisted across Hemingway's vessel was apparently of Rorschach's design and was seemingly on loan. At first, I wondered if this could be a familial relationship between a parent and a child, both of whom were clearly adults at this stage of their lives. This is probably not the case though, given that in the next reading one refers to the other as my friend which isn't really the kind of greeting you would give to a family member. Of course, that's all speculative, but I think the hints are there. It seems very clear that Hemingway is Rorschach's subordinate, and is the lesser of the two in terms of reputation and esteem. Ido's notes at the end here also give us a major hint about the way Hemingway's character would evolve. At this point, they don't seem to be too attached to the penitent, which can be seen by how they happily discuss it with a degree of separation from themselves. Ido states at the end of the transcription, however, that all the planets in the system that was being commented on by Hemingway were found as dead worlds that had suffered from crude explosions of some kind. This is the first hint at the fate of Hemingway's garden paradise that they were building. In the end, it was destroyed. This destruction clearly didn't serve what they believed the final shape to be, given that they believed that they were building a part of it within that system. This inevitably would change Hemingway in ways that we still can't necessarily have fathomed, given that we have a limited set of records at our disposal. Additionally, it should be noted that these records are also remarkable because they are the oldest records recovered in existence by our measure, these records predate the witness, and so are ancient beyond even the books of sorrow. And that is saying something. In fact, civilizations mentioned within the books of sorrow are at this point in the reading 
so uncivilized that they don't even have civilization, they don't even have personhood, they've yet to emerge from the primordial ooze, which means that this predates the Books of Sorrow by potentially millions or even billions of years. That in itself is staggering. Not for nothing, this is an important record because as far as the overall timeline of destiny is concerned, unless you count the unveiling lore book to be quite literal and to believe that there was indeed a time before time, which I don't think is impossible, you still have to acknowledge that as far as written history is concerned, this is our oldest record ever. So that really is something to keep hold of and to remember. It is truly remarkable. Now there is also a quick note to be made about where they were recovered from. You might have remembered that in the vanilla campaign of Destiny 1 we actually went to Venus and raided a catch there. Not a actual raid, quote unquote, but a story mission. And in that story mission we actually boarded the Simix Fell. This is in the vanilla campaign and when we were on board we would actually kill the Kel of the House of Winter, Draxis. This catch has just been sitting there in the Ishtar Sink forever since. And, I mean, it is old, but perhaps more importantly it shows us just how storied these catches are. They made it all the way across the void of space between Earth and Reese and encountered incredible stuff along the way, not least the pyramid vessel that gave us these records. That alone is noteworthy, but it also implies that the House of Winter has long abandoned this catch, given that they are now mostly disbanded or defeated. Anyway, back to Hemingway and Rorschach, they seemingly would have a direct conversation as the next entry in our grouping of three. After the destruction of Hemingway's system by whoever created the detonations on the planet's surface, this log for this particular conversation was recovered from a different fallen catch, this time belonging to the fallen House of Rain, which was based predominantly on Mercury before their eventual dissolution over time. Ido was regardless able to recover these logs from the old vessel's data core, which was in the possession of Osiris and Saint-14. The vessel was known as the Talix Sin, and I believe we may have seen it when we stepped back through time to assist Saint-14. The conversation between Hemingway and Rorschach, which is contained within this communication log, is pretty long, but also it is unbelievably revealing. It reads as follows. Type Communications Log Retrieved from Rainship Talix Sin Databank Q20K2G Origin HD37124 Long Range Communications Buoy Derelict Scrapped for Parts Keywords Final Shape HNW047622 RS6243199 Identities HNW047622 RS6243199 Annotated transcription follows. We mustn't abandon the path to the final shape simply because it is difficult. Difficult? You are being willfully obtuse. Difficult might describe a sustained effort or self-denial done with intent and care for one's own well-being. What you're describing is coercion. A moment's coercion to prevent a millennia's suffering. We can see what will happen if we sit idly by, if we choose to do nothing, and in our inaction allow this carnage to continue, then we are complicit. Thus, the ethical choice is to act. At what cost? With what means? Would you advocate for the use of violence? Will you approve the murder of those who disagree? Will you and your merciful, penitent, benefic, cause lesser harm for a greater good? No, never. The purpose and the means are inseparable. It is simple teleology. We are not advocating for needless cruelty. There are countless methods of intervention at our disposal with compassion as their guiding pillar. The transition, uplifting, enlightenment, would be uncomfortable, naturally, but the alternative is to sit idly by and watch the inevitable extinction of a species, an extinction we could prevent. If the final shape is truly the greatest good imaginable, then its rightness should be self-evident. 
It should be so clear to anyone and anything that comprehends it that we should never need to do more than share the information for them to reach the same conclusion. That we failed to do so, even among the consensus, suggests imperfections in our own understanding. If we cannot prove an apodictic final shape even to each other, to our own kin whom we strive to understand as well as our own selves, then how can we possibly declare it fit to teach to others? What good is perfection if it is purely theoretical? All concepts are refined through practice. If we focus on ourselves to the exclusion of all others, if we refuse to help others and thereby pursue our perfect happiness at the cost of their interminable pain, what do we call that if not selfishness? Humility? Acceptance of our own limited perspective? Indifference to suffering? I am not indifferent. I would gladly endure pain if doing so would help others. It is a different matter entirely to force it upon someone else, even for the sake of another. An improperly healed bone must be rebroken before it can set properly. An infected wound must be lanced. Do you abstain from uprooting weeds even if they threaten to strangle your garden? If some suffering is inevitable, then surely it is better to seek the maximum good from it. If the choice is between greater and lesser evils, then the choice itself is flawed. I refuse to participate. I agree with you, in theory, but we do not exist purely in the theoretical. This suffering is already happening now, all the time, everywhere we look. Come, see me, and I will show you the observatory's readings. Such sights as we have seen, my friend, make me sick to my soul. I thought the observatory could only see possibilities, the future branches of past visible light readings. We have made improvements. The glass mines trim the excess branches. What we see now are the strongest paths, and in the seeing they become true. Then tell me what you have seen. I gain nothing from running from the truth, no matter how uncomfortable. Cities turning on themselves in a frenzy of self-destruction. Children offering up parents in superstitious sacrifice to bloodied gods. An entire people who would boil off their own atmosphere rather than let their neighbors enjoy fresh air. Great waves drowning worlds, bodies which do not decompose for everything down to the very bacteria has died as well machine plagues, carving their prediction machines into moons. Your garden destroyed. As the observatory saw it, so it came to pass. I, uh, apologize. That was... I was unkind. I was wrong to bring up old hurts. As you say... Sometimes an infected wound must be lanced before it can heal. You should not be ashamed of your physician's instinct. I have meditated on your words. I sat in my ship keeping company with the pain I felt when I saw my worlds burning. That terrible loss. You would prevent such a thing from happening again. You have always wished to protect others from harm, and I honor that. But I have reached a different conclusion from you. As I saw the ruin of my great work, my thoughts traced a different path. If the final shape is the greatest good, then it must be enduring, incontrovertible, self-fulfilling. That my garden could be destroyed suggests that it was not a final shape after all. Perhaps the ships which came to burn it down understand the final shape better than I do. Are you suggesting that the final shape of that system was its destruction? For it to be left a blasted ruin? Is it not a possibility? Then what we have seen through the observatory might as well be the final shape too. Suffering and misery, anarchy, endless self-consuming hedonism, utter sterility. How can any of that be considered a greatest good? The core of the final shape is improvement. Consider the virus, my friend, the parasite, the predator, these things that exist only by taking from others, 
To these things, improvement may well entail causing greater and greater harm to others, not out of malice, but as a simple fact of existence. When you eradicate an illness, are you stamping out a microscopic final shape? Should we care less for the final shape of a disease simply because it is smaller than us? Or because it does us harm? We have all studied our histories. We know what we are capable of. What if the nihilists, redolent, accepting, are right and our final shape is our own destruction? Are you seriously considering the words of a fringe group of self-flagellating pessimists? This is pure nihilistic indulgence, abdication of responsibility. The existence of past evil does not invalidate future good. Should we deny what we can do because of what we have done? We of the merciful, penitent, benefic, have asked similar questions and reached our own answer. We have survived unimaginable suffering, even at one another's hands. The gardener encourages our growth and improvement day by day. Who better to understand the struggles of others and guide them out of these miserable warrens into the light of day? We could help the whole universe to be better than they are, just as we are always striving to be better tomorrow than we are today. We could help them, and they will go on to help others. The good we do can compound just as the evil has in the past. And yet, the first chosen of the gardener cannot agree on our own way. The gardener offers us no guidance, no principles with which to use the gifts it gives us, no reassurance for the doubts that plague us, no answers for our questions. Why have we been chosen? Why does the gardener, in its power and wisdom, not achieve perfection itself? If my garden was not meant to be destroyed, why did it not stop the invaders? And why does it allow its gifts to be misused? It did not correct the profusion, bountiful, swarm, on their path to their great fatal error. It did not stop the conquerors, primacy, sovereign, from using the gifts it granted for subjugation, are we to accept that these two were meant to happen? If you reject the notion that destruction can be a final shape, how are we to accept that the gardener allowed us to make such grievous mistakes? Even after all these millennia, there is much we do not understand about the gardener. Perhaps we will not understand until we have achieved the final shape for ourselves. And when we have reached the final shape, will it all make sense? Will we all be able to live in a universe where people act as they have always acted, for the self-evident good, where evil does not exist because we do not allow it? Where all are aligned without suffering or doubt? This isn't like you, my friend. I am coming to see you. All will be well. Scribe Notes Note 1 The final shape is no longer described with a ternary semantic cluster, but HNW and RS continue to use that structure to describe other concepts, potentially reflective of semantic narrowing. This first bullet point is noted next to the words final shape. Note 2 Given the terminology, this consensus might have been some sort of governing body or a source of philosophical guidance. This second note is listed next to the word consensus in the communication logs. Note 3. From the context, some sort of computational assistant? There appears to be some etymological overlap with the names of vex minds. Something to investigate later, perhaps. This third note is listed next to the word glass mines. My cross check for the identification code in scribe archive XI24A proved quite fruitful. The trail of data crumbs led me to a data bank retrieved from a rain ship originally downed on Mercury. The saint and Osiris were kind enough to share it with me, along with a pot of tea. 
Our conversation was most illuminating. I understand that Mercury was a scorched wasteland before the Great Machine's arrival. When it had finished, humans could walk unprotected on its surface. What wonders the Great Machine can work. I can only hope that Mercury will return from the Witness's clutches, released as Titan was, so that I may see it for myself. I hear that, thanks to Sol engulfing its sky, one could study without pause. Or at least until exhaustion proved greater than the desire to learn. Perhaps I could catch up on some light reading. In any case, the concept of the final shape has worn many faces. From your encounters with the Disciples of the Witness, we know that they all had their own understandings of this concept, that they all saw what they wished to see in it. But this communications log here appears to predate all of them. If I am correct, and the party's communication are among the Witness's precursors, then this may be the concept's original form. We can see in this log that HNW and RS at least were preoccupied with the concept of a higher purpose. They sought the final shape, but at the time of this exchange they did not agree on what it was or how to achieve it. RS speaks of how the final shape will prevent suffering and maximize benefit. HNW expresses concern over the method of achieving this. I notice, however, that they never speak of communicating directly with the species they discuss. There is no consideration of consulting others, or even if they are capable of reaching the final shape for themselves and others. The most pressing matter in their discussion is if they should or should not intervene, and to a lesser extent, whether some coercion is acceptable for the greater good. I understand that, granted the blessings of the great machine, Elixni and humanity have both fallen into similar traps. The certainty of one's own righteousness, the arrogance, the belief that receiving the great machine's gifts confers superiority to others. Given the length of time between this record and scribe archive XI24A, it appears that the great machine stayed with their civilization for millennia. If it had stayed on Reese for that long, if humanity's golden age had continued unending, would we also have fallen victim to the same mentality? Lost sight of others as equals and seen them as animals to be herded? I think I prefer where we have come to stand. Together, walking the same streets beneath the shadow of the great machine. So, there is an absolute ton to unpack from this particular entry. It is the longest of them and there is a lot to go over. Not just because this entire conversation advances the story of Hemingway and Rorschach, but also because it mentions quite a lot of tangent-worthy stuff. For starters, this is the pivot in Hemingway's story, and tragically, I think it comes about from the persuasiveness and perhaps well-intentioned attempts of their friend Rorschach to convince them that the final shape's nature, as the penitent believed it to be, was correct. The ramifications of this potentially successful persuasion later down the line will be evident in the next entry which we again see sent to Rorschach from Hemingway, but just before a far more important moment in history. That might be the major personal shift undertaken thanks to these communications between the major characters involved here, but the things that are revealed in this entry between all of that are of even greater importance and potential intrigue in my mind. Before I do jump further into these things, a word of caution. Bungie is very well known for hiding red herrings in some of their writing, especially when it is so obviously adjacent to something and it seems to be screaming about that. There is always the potential for red herrings, so let's just keep that in mind as we go on to talk about things that certainly fit into that category of stuff that is adjacent and obvious as a reference to what it seems to be calling out. That said, let's discuss the so-called glass mines. These glass mines are supposedly a part of an observatory of some sort, used by the precursors, and its function was to see the future with a greater degree of clarity. I don't know if this is the case, but that certainly sounds like an Oxer machine to me. Might be completely circumstantial, who knows. 
It's here that we see a truly remarkable development that changes the course of Destiny's history, if it's to be believed, which is that the glass mines seem to be the earliest known reference in history to the Vex. This could well be the origin of the Vex in their entirety. To better understand this though, let's talk about why the Vex are often conflated with things to do with glass. If you look at a Vex, you can see the robot, yes. But the actual living part of any Vex is the radiolarian fluid, the white stuff that you can see at their cores, aka the juice box. The mind fluid inside is the real form of the Vex, and it is radiolaria. But what is radiolaria? Well, they're microscopic life, that's the simple way to put it, but the important part for us to note is that most radiolaria have shell casings that are created of silica. Silica is our link to glass. Silica was a primary component of quartz found in deserts, which in many cases was then taken and turned into some of the oldest formulas of glass. It is a well-known thing that under the right conditions and with the right ingredients, if you heat up sand, you will get glass. This is perhaps an explanation of why, when the Vex organize their radiolaria into structures, they sometimes create fractal structures with the appearance of glass. The most obvious case of this is clearly that of the Vault of Glass, which is also of immediate relevance here given the whole ability to take a look into time and even quote-unquote trim the irrelevant branches. The glass mines referenced by Rorschach share a lot of similarity to the Vex and display similar properties to them, needless to say. The key one here is the ability to accurately predict the future. So here we might have the first linking proof that the Vex might have originated from the Precursors. Those of you who want to look back into the lore of the Unveiling book might remember that there's a little bit of commentary on the Vex from there, implying that they are primal patterns of a kind that escaped the garden before time and fell into the material universe as a sort of template for a successful form of life, one that might survive against all other odds. Whilst I won't make commentary on whether Unveiling is or isn't a retelling of Precursor history in parable form, I think the involvement of Vex in both Entelechy and Unveiling does seem to handily link the Vex in with the Precursors no matter where you shake your stick. That being said, I'm not going to judge you too much for what you believe on that front of things. I'm still currently in the process of creating another, hopefully not as long, video talking about the two major philosophical points surrounding unveiling and whether it is mythical or actual. There's a lot of material I need to cover though, so I'm going to get to that first. Anyway, to return to Entelechy, the glass mines here are seen to give gut-wrenching predictions about the future of the universe. These predictions, such as planets being turned into thinking machines and cities turning on themselves in a frenzy of self-destruction are all events that I think will happen in the future relative to Rorschach and Hemingway. But from our perspective, reading this book now, I think it's clear that many of these events have actually already happened. Take the note of great waves drowning worlds, for example. Lorehounds like myself immediately probably thought of Fundament and the God Wave as proof of this, but it's worth remembering that the God Wave was indeed a lie invented by the Witness. Therefore, I think that this might instead be referring to the people of Titan, who saw great waves drowning their own world as the Arcologies were primed for destruction in the Collapse. The note of machine plagues carving their prediction machines into moons seemed like a convenient bit of the Vex predicting their own future. That is odd for themselves to be displaying it in this manner, but then again, maybe this is a little evidence that the Vex and the glass mines are related, but not quite in the same way that we might understand. Maybe the structures of the glass mines were something that morphed into the Vex, but maybe they aren't actually the Vex at this moment. Unusual, but Still, worth keeping in mind, we don't know enough to actually confirm anything. Regardless, the moon being burrowed into here by machines with their prediction engines could well be any number of planetoids throughout Sol, but I think this most accurately fits the description of the moon of Jupiter, known as Io, and technically also Europa, though the Vex infestation there was introduced at a later stage and hasn't probably run as deep. 
It is worth noting though that of course the Vex have burrowed through many moons and many planetoids in the solar system. The children offering up parents as superstitious sacrifice to bloodied gods could be any number of terrible groups practicing. It could reference the worm gods being granted salvation thanks to the exchange of their freedom for their mother's servitude to Rolk, for example. Sadly, I fear the most likely case for such a circumstance comes from the groups worshipping Nezarek. It is known that the Scions would at one point offer up those whom Nezarek had observed in some sort of ritual, sacrificially, of course. Such offerings would be shown in the visions of Acacia, and as we saw from them, they were capable of tearing families apart. So I find it easy to imagine that children could in many cases have offered up their parents. This isn't documented, but perhaps such a practice could have continued by the cult of Nezarek on Earth. Michael is one of the only priests of that cult that we've known of thus far, Michael and his father. He was introduced to it by his father though, and we don't know what's happened to them since that moment. As best we know, they are dead. There is the rather interesting note about the idea of an entire people who would boil off their own atmosphere rather than share it with their neighbors. This is a curious case, which is oddly specific and I believe I could be missing something here, but the only records that I could recall of a planet with something even close to that description was a planet whose atmosphere was burned away by an invading extraterrestrial species who used a massive radiation burst to destroy half the planet's atmosphere all in an instant. This was the extraterrestrial invasion of the home planet of the Karg Eclipse, a subsequent servant species of the Cabal, from whom the Shadow Rul was sourced. The Karg Eclipse may now all be dead, or they could still be fighting their terrible war. It isn't clear, but regardless, this is one of the only instances where a planet's atmosphere has been burned away rather than shared. Cities turning on themselves in a frenzy of self-destruction could make reference to anything. The images conjured in my mind are those of the Last City and Neomuna. On the Last City's case, we have the fate of the Faction Wars, which nearly killed the Last City in its crib. On Neomuna, there are a few events to note, including events that didn't quite happen, but almost did. In particular, one has to examine how Nezarek was using nightmares to drive the people of Neomuna to a certain degree of madness, which resulted in internal damages to the city's infrastructure even before all the citizens were sent into the Cloud Ark. In particular, though, we need to remember the past of Neomuna, including the actions of a group known as the Uplift Coven, who at one point were insistent on the idea that they should all be allowed to ascend into Cloud Striders, and therefore they launched an insurgency to attempt to accomplish this goal. Finally, the bodies and death of even bacteria isn't clear either. Total death in such a manner hasn't been seen by any of us as best we know, but it might make reference to the world discovered by the Drifter and his now dead crew a world swimming in darkness and cold, covered with strange pyramid structures, a darkness that robbed the very light from the ghosts and made resurrection impossible, a place where nothing grew and nothing seemed to live save for the strange occupants of the pyramids staring always at the drifter. All these predictions have seemingly either explicitly happened or probably have happened, and thus they seem to lend a great degree of credibility to the accuracy of the glass mines and the degree of accuracy to which they operate is staggering in this respect. The glass mines also seem to perfectly predict the fall of Hemingway's perfect system by ships who came to raise it to nothing more than a series of barren wastelands. The very existence of these ships seems to imply that life has indeed existed for longer than we can fathom and that even in the time of the precursors the universe was a fertile place. It implies that some civilizations might have been out there that we previously didn't even discover and may never discover now that they might have been wiped clean by the witness. Regardless, the destruction of the garden that Hemingway was creating seems to have fundamentally shifted their position and makes them fall into a state of nihilism. This aligns closely with the philosophical idea of the nihilists 
as defined by the precursors relating to the final shape. Hemingway then starts to talk about these ideas, which brings a degree of alarm to Rorschach. Looking into Ido's notes, here she reflects on something significant, which is that the three-bracketed structure of syntax throughout the readings, aka the bit where they say penitent, benefic, whatever it may be, has gone for some of these words. Ido believes that this might be a narrowing of definitions after a time of refinement. In particular, this happens to the final shape, which previously shared its space with the context of Pyramidian and Summit. If nothing else, it shows a final passage of time and a focus of the precursor on their society's ultimate need to discover the final shape at all costs. Regardless of this idea being more of a focus for precursor civilization, they still hadn't landed upon a single definition of what the final shape truly was. Certainly, there were firm positions on the matter, even ones that were dominant or well supported in their time, but much like the Witnesses' disciples now, the actual nature of the final shape wasn't ever made truly clear. It is clear, though, that this was akin to achieving a form of perfection, and was about as elusive as that concept as well. Ido does make an important note on top of this, which is that the precursors, regardless of their station, regardless of their position within this great argument of what the final shape was, all did hold one thing in common. Regardless of whether they would intervene and assist the rest of the universe like the penitent, or stand by and watch it burn like the nihilists, the other species they would be leaving or assisting didn't seem to have any say in the matter. The precursors seemed to view themselves as greater than other beings, in a sort of higher station than them. Given that Ido notes that the Traveler might have stayed with them for centuries, falling into this mindset seems almost natural. Hubris born of the Traveler's gifts was almost certainly a part of the problem here. It is possibly this mentality that allowed them to fall into such a place as believing that creating the Witness was a logical and moral outcome a being who knew the final shape and who did not care for the qualms of others. The penitent philosophy manifest, but twisted into a terrible extreme, built on a foundation of desperation and rage, built on the need to be right above the need to grant others deference or mercy. It's with that context that we can perhaps look into the final communication between these two characters. In this instance, many years have clearly passed, the Precursors have discovered the Veil and have unsuccessfully tried to integrate it with the Traveler, and thus the Traveler has left them. The final message is sent at the precipice of the Precursors merging, just before they have crossed from a society of many to one being of many. This is a final message sent to Rorschach in the desperate hours before the Witness's creation. By this point, Hemingway has changed and so has Rorschach. Rorschach has rejected the entire civilization and gone into self-imposed exile. As a great thinker of the time, this was perhaps a prudent position for them to take. Hemingway, on the other hand, has changed tack and has embraced the position of the penitent and agreed with their decision to merge with the witness. Though, not completely. In these final moments, Hemingway reached out in secret and sent the following message recovered from the mind core of a Vex that Aldrin Sov would eventually retrieve from the Black Garden. Type Communications Log Retrieved from Reef Cryptarchy Archives 10 Hygieia Origin Core Vex Minotaur Sol Divisive Black Garden Retrieved by Prince Aldrin Decryption Successful Keywords HNW047622 Final Shape Identities HNW047622 Annotated transcription follows Incoming Quantum Flicker My distant friend, I hope you still have your communicator. Though our last parting was acrimonious, and it has been many centuries since I have last seen your message alert glimmering in the corner of my vision, I choose to believe you have not cut this last atomic line between us. I composed this message in secret. The rest of the consensus would not understand. They do not know you as I do. I did. But they could. It is in that hope that I reach out toward you now. 
My friend, the consensus has won. Yesterday, the penitent voted I. The nihilists and solipsists have been destroyed. We will exuviate and shepherd the universe to its final shape. We will prune away its dead branches and coax forth its full potential. Even as I say those words, I feel the old doubts crawling through my thoughts again. But it has been long, and longer still, since you renounced the consensus and set off into the cosmos. You have not seen the violence that visited our shores, a terrible reflection of that ancient history which we believed was behind us. Though we were steadfast in our position, and would have continued to argue it however long it might take, there were dangerous elements, subversives and defectors. We did not strike first, nor did we choose our response lightly. It had been so long since I wielded pruning shears, I had forgotten how. My hands shook. I could imagine how you would have looked at me. But it is over now. What has been done is done. They were the last, and now we are all in consensus. If I wished to persuade you with words alone, I would not have told you this. You have steadfastly abhorred such measures since they were first proposed. I do not tell you this to shock or intimidate you, nor would I withhold this truth, because I do not seek to persuade you with a lie, even of omission. I tell you this because I respect you. Of everyone I have ever known, you have been fiercest in your compassion, most keenly aware of the gap between means and ends. If you return, if you join the consensus, then I will know our cause is true. That after all this time, we have finally found our apodictic truth. I will discard myself with no regrets. I do not say this to put my finger on the scale of your decision, only to inform you of the situation. After our exuviation, we will no longer know the shape of your absence. What we are becoming will not be capable of doubt or dissent. It will never have been capable of such things. We will forget our pain, our strife, our petty grudges, our prejudices. It will no longer exist, and therefore will never have existed. Do you understand? There is not much time. Now that we are in consensus, our progress is unhindered. The veil unravels before us. The fundamental principles we have long hoped for are woven in its threads. And when we have completed the process and thrown off our lesser selves, we will be perfect. Even so, I cannot help but nurture this seed of heresy, the grit which I hope will be subsumed by the pearl, that what we become will be lesser if it is made without you. How could perfection be lesser? Yet the feeling burns in my veins, so I must share it with you. I confess this in selfishness. I do not want to forget you. HNW 047622 Transcription ends. Scribe Notes Note 1 this group appears to be the same as the merciful slash penitent slash benefic mentioned in Scribe Archive XI92C. There is no usage of ternary semantic clusters whatsoever throughout the text. This note appears next to the word penitent. I did not expect to find this. I pen these notes as I await my audience with Mara Kell in the reef, as there are many matters which require her attention. The hours stretched on, and I searched the databanks for old identification codes on a whim. To think that this data was retrieved by Prince Aldrin's solve. Is this what humans mean when they say they feel someone walking on their grave? Though, in the Prince's case, that grave is empty. Would it be too awkward if I thanked Crow for an act in a past life? I apologize, I'm rambling, and two different Techians have asked me now if I'm quite alright. Physically, I suppose. I am a little tired. This journey has taken me far, and I have slept perhaps slightly less than is ideal. But in truth, I feel deeply disturbed by this record. I cannot clearly interpret my own reaction. It is too visceral, overwhelming. Disgust and horror mixed with pity. I even find myself feeling sympathy. Sympathy for 
someone who admits openly to murdering dissenters. The people who purposefully erased their own history as though not remembering those crimes would absolve them of it. For the minds that would form the witness, for those who destroyed Reese. And yet, in my horror, I am reminded of the Guardians. After all, we do not blame Crow for the actions of the Prince, nor should we. When Glint brought him back in the Great Machine's light, Crow was born anew, as were Ikora and Zavala and you. It is as Ikora says, is it not? Grace and memory, the light forgets. Just as the witness forgot. But then I think, no. The witness did not forget. It was not reborn, it did not choose unreasonable grace, it exuviated in its own words. But it remembered where it came from. It shows what to forget, not to allow for new possibility, but to destroy it. A self-justifying teleology. It is not just reality that the witness mutilates, it has dissected and reassembled itself, its own memories, its own history. The witness went from confronting the uncomfortable truth to raising it. It is grotesque. As a scribe, as Ido, I cannot feel anything but revulsion. This final note is revealing all on its own and concludes the great tragedy which we get just as the Traveler left. This brief window that we got into Precursor Society may only be three logs long, but it's clear that one of each log represents a different age of the Precursor Society, and this was one of the most desperate. The moment when the Precursors took to the sword instead of words, and thus the penitent would eventually stand dominant above all else. This was how the witness was made. This was how it was forged. But in this final message, we do actually get some important information about the witness, and something else incredibly important. A note that should be made. If Rorschach fled and made a conscious effort to exile themselves from the rest of the Precursors, we absolutely have to contemplate this simple fact. They might still be alive. The Precursors had technology beyond anything we knew before. The logs between Rorschach and Hemingway went on for seemingly a huge span of Precursor history. Their natural age is one thing, but we also know that the Traveler augments the lifespans of some species based on what happened to humanity. If the Traveler had been with them for millennia, who knows what improvements to their lifespan and the advancements in medical technology might have rendered. This would make Rorschach the oldest being in the universe, aside from perhaps the Traveler and the Veil. But if they are still alive, then perhaps finding them should be one of our great priorities. And why? Because they might have crucial contextual information about the penitent, the witness, and those who merged to form it. It's here that we need to bring up that other important note about the witness, which is that we now understand a little more about how these beings merged to create it. The first thing of note is that they wiped out their rivals in their society in order to reach the consensus where a point of merging might be agreed upon. Great conflicts and terrible evils had clearly ensued after the departure of the Traveler and the loss of all hope in Precursor society. It's not clear how long this took, but by this point, all were united in consensus, at least publicly. It is here that we see some small measure of advantage at last, because in secret, some did not believe. What we have discovered about the Witness is a few weaknesses. These are not cracks or breaks in its armor, nor are they flaws in its weapons. They are instead fragments of ignorance that we might be able to exploit to our own ends and for our own benefit. Firstly, we have the knowledge that the consensus decision to merge into the Witness was not truly a consensus without doubt. Hemingway's communications to Rorschach prove this. Assuming that Rorschach never returned to reunite with the Penitent and become a part of the Witness as well. If at any point we are able to extract and show the individual consciousnesses from within the Witness, if we're able to find Hemingway, this doubt might prove a useful wedge. It is proof of the imperfection of the Witness, the imperfection of its ideas. It is proof that the consensus was not truly as united as it believed itself to be, and therefore the surety upon which the Witness founds its decisions might be challenged. It's also important to remember 
But even as we say these things, it's not clear if we could split off parts and pieces of the witness into the prior penitent members. But then again, the few images we have received from the final shape of the witness aren't showing the witness explicitly, but a massive alignment, a ridge of arms and hands, almost like a rib built of body parts. This maybe implies that what the witness is changing into in the future might well be something different entirely, and if each of those individual sets of hands is representative of a precursor who has been split and spread from the witness's main corpus, perhaps it's possible that they might be extracted after all. That is very much something of speculation, but it's worth keeping that in mind. If it is also true, there is a second thing we must consider, which is that the witness lacks knowledge pertaining to some of its own origins, some of the evils that the society creating it had conducted. It has forgotten these things that the precursors knew, and whilst it has some idea of its origins before, clearly it has been given a imperfect version of this truth. In its own surety, the witness would seem indomitable and impossible to change, but if the bedrock foundation of that stability is broken, then the witness may be forced to reconsider, or might become rash in the process. These advantages are seemingly small, but perhaps it is the same as what happened with Savathun. Confronting her with the idea of the witness's deception was something which in the moment might have seemed small, but it shook her to her core and gave us a small edge needed to cut her reign short and stop her plans. The witness will be even deadlier, this much is certain, but the witness is also shored up by an even more foundational lie, that it was built on consensus, that it was the will of the people united, that they had discerned the nature of the final shape through true consensus. We also know a little more about the nature of the witness. It is not truly a god despite the incredible power it displays, which some might describe as godlike, and despite how it seems to be nigh unassailable. It is fallible, by the nature of its creators, despite its own assuredness. If this assuredness is based on data and clarity, that's one thing, but given that it's made up of all the penitent, that might not be the case. If that assuredness is a thing of arrogance or hubris, then there is perhaps a chance that the witness might not necessarily be able to gauge our plans for itself. Our unpredictability might yet again be the reason for our salvation, if that is to be the case. This is mostly the end of my analysis, though. These logs are the first of a few deep dives into the IntelliQ law book that I'll be doing soon, and I'm sorry that it took so long. I plan on making it a far shorter span of time between now and the next piece of content that I make. But for the moment, I think it's worth pointing out that with the Witness's origins revealed, there is something else of value that's been gained here. We've now had our eyes opened not just to the weaknesses of the Witness or its origins and creation, but also to a whole new chapter of the history of Destiny's universe, a history that was first expanded by the Books of Sorrow, and then by the various lore recounting the breadth of the Cabal Empire, and then by the lore of Rulk, Lubre, and his other exploits. Now we know that there was a wider universe still in the time of the Precursors, and that there are more mysteries to uncover. As we expand our knowledge of these further points, the story of the wider universe is bound to open up. In its own way, that is a blessing for certain, even as we discover more about the world that lies before us, even as we start to understand the precursors and their terrible darkness more. It is a strange time to be listening to lore about destiny, that much is clear. But if this is anything to judge the change of the wind by, then at very least, this small entry this story in itself, this notion of the precursors and the history that we still have yet to uncover, gives me an idea that things are at least somewhat headed in an interesting direction. But that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for listening to this video, and I hope that you appreciate that it was a lot of work making this. I took approximately a week thinking and working on this particular one, doing additional research and figuring out what was what, because I figured it was important. This is our first record, truly, of the precursors beyond that of Asa, and so if we are to truly get more detail on these things, I figured that we had best make that detail explicitly clear and sure of things. So, 
With that being said, if you did enjoy, go ahead and leave a like and also leave your thoughts down below in the comments section. If you want more Destiny lore, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe. Help feed that algorithm and yeah, we'll see more of this at some point soon. But as per usual, know that your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.